perfect. Super. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Liz Arbuckle. I've got a fabulous team helping me, helping support Ojibwe storytelling tonight. We have Sorella Ford for you will be joining us in a few moments, but while you settle in and log in, we always ask for you to please get into the chat box and you'll see down here on these little buttons, um, the chat box and tell us where you're joining us from. So I am joining you from Ashland. So. St. Cloud. Illinois, Wisconsin, Sheboygan. We've got people coming in from all over the place. And I'd like to give a shout out to our, we've got two uh, watch parties tonight. We've got one here at the Visitor Center. I'm joining you live from the Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center in Ashland. And we have a, a watch party going on across the hall. And Sorella and I are gonna hop over and say hi to those guys after we're done streaming with you tonight and then we also have one way on the other side of the state down in Racine and I understand you guys have had some crazy weather but my pal down in Racine said uh, the lake has kept things a little a little uh, off for them so they've just had rain uh, so um, we've got a few minutes before we're going to start. Oh, Rebecca said it is still raining here. So yeah down there at the watch party so I hope they're getting a good turnout at the Racine library. Shout out to all the libraries that helped us advertise this event. We really appreciate it. It's great to have fabulous partners with our libraries, with our local historical associations. Um, it has been, it's been, it's always a good experience. And this is our third year of doing storytelling with our group. So, and Franksville, Wisconsin. Now, Allison, you have stumped me. I'm not sure where Franksville is. I'm going to have to look that one up. I know a lot of little towns in Wisconsin, especially northern Wisconsin. Some of these. Oh, it's right outside Racine. <laughs> That's great. And Manitowoc and Vermont. That is super. It's really wonderful having everyone here tonight. I'm gonna step away for just a moment to make sure everything's going okay with Cirilla's. Is everything all going okay with your equipment, Cirilla? Okay. And you guys just keep um, putting in where you're coming from. We absolutely love We go. Sorry, Spokane, Washington. That is fabulous. Are you sure?
Oh, we've got someone who's now up. <laughs> we just had a special friend show up for a good luck hug. It's wonderful. Well, it is great to see everyone. How are things down by your way, Amy and Kristen? I know you guys are down in the southern part of Wisconsin. Are you getting uh, a lot of snow? Because we up here have not, which is a little we, unusual. Down here in Madison, we have lovely snow. It was a little sparse in the beginning, but it's looking lovely out there. Wow. Shoveling has been done, and we'll probably have to do more in the morning. <laughs> always and we've sore. we've got about three or four inches in new berlin so not quite as many as in madison okay but it That's... really does seem like a, a lovely evening for for some winter storytelling the the vibe is here <laughs> <laughs> sounds good that sounds great and it looks like we've got lots of folks logging in which is fabulous telling us where they're from and where is the team joining us from amy you said madison right uh -huh. madison yes and Kristen, you're coming in from i'm coming in from new berlin tonight okay. janet how about you hey everybody i'm here in eau claire tonight super and luke i'm in madison Fantastic. We are coming in from all parts of the state. Um, we just got a few more minutes. If you just hang on. Actually, I can probably go to the next slide. Kristen, could you advance me to the next slide and I can do some of the housekeeping stuff? Thank you. Perfect. Well, I do want to thank you all for coming. We're really excited to have Sorella Ford. Um, joining us tonight. She drove all the way up from LCO to Ashland here to, to, to be with us. And just going to go over a few of our housekeeping things. So when you joined the Zoom, you were automatically muted. We couldn't see you. We couldn't hear you. And that's how it's going to be. That's how these webinars work. If you do have a question, you can type it into the question and answer box. So anytime during the discussion, because right now we have the chat box open. That's so you guys can say a quick hello. Um, but we're going to close that as soon as Sorella starts sharing her stories. And but we will leave the Q and A button open. So feel feel free to okay, yeah, feel free to come on and and put in any question you have or comments you have in that area, and we'll read those to her at the end. So about 10, 15 minutes at the end. Um. So, Sorella, did you want to use my laptop? Is that what's happened? Okay. 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 All right. Well, then, without further ado, I will announce our speaker, Sorella Ford, and I will turn it over to her. And Kristen's going to close the chat box for us. So um, we'll, we'll put that, if you didn't get to put your town in yet, don't worry, there will be time at the end. We'll open it up for the last few minutes. And like I said, if you have any questions, please put that in the Q&A and Cyril will answer as many as she can. So without further ado, Ms. Cyrilla Ford, take it away, Cyrilla. Yep. <laughs>
was I, was it me? Okay. All right. All right, you can hear me now. All right. So, sorry about that. Who's you? Asanawabi Akwe, Indigenous Cast, Odawa Zaka Ganing, and Dunjaba. Sarala, Jaganashi Mo, and Indigenous Cast. My Inca and Indon Dame. Nimenawea, Omai Ayan. So I did our our protocol of introducing ourselves. I let you know that my Anishinaabe name is White Stone Woman. I come from Lakutare. Uh, my English name is Cirilla, and I come from the Wolf Clan. And it is good to be here. I am thankful for the invite. Um, granted, yes, I was nervous. I am nervous, but it's a good nervous. It's a fun nervous. Uh, I usually am kind of like a background type person. I, <clears throat> my sister Becky is actually the one who is more outspoken and hopefully one day we can get her up here. And in fact, she can actually answer more questions that you may have in regards to our Palos. You know, our family, we end up growing up in, I end up growing up in a Palo family. Uh, I danced. Shaw when I was younger. My sister was Shaw. She, we, both of us now dance jingle. Um, our older siblings used to dance in Chicago. I was real young then. But we had pictures of them and my sister Muriel gets, yeah, it, it's good seeing her in her outfit. Um, so I was asked to come up and do Ojibwe storytelling. And I let Liz know that I do have stories that I've learned over the years, um, and I shared them with our youth. I, when I was younger, I ended up attending Northland College, and I lived up here in Bad River for a long time. I raised my kids up here. Uh, going to Northland College, you know, I know, maybe some of you guys remember Joe Rose. You know, I every time I see him, I always give him a hug. You know, that was. And just appreciate that with him. Um, when I went to North Lincoln College, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I wasn't sure what degree I wanted to follow. Uh, I liked math. I um, actually was thinking psychology. And I like business. I end up graduating from Northern College with a business degree. I raised my kids up here. We stayed up here for a long time. When I went to college, I, you know, that part was as first generation that graduated. And I'm very grateful for that because I had my family support. Um, like I said, our family grew up and we were a, a Powell family. When I was younger, my Family, we'd always go to Powell's during the summer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Camera, just a little bit. That's sweet. Yeah. There, that looks better. Yeah. You go, girl. <laughs> All right. Um, from Northern College, I'm going to try to give you a really short history of my lifespan, I guess. Working, uh, graduated Northern College, I worked at Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, I worked in the accounting office. When I worked there, I was very grateful. Um, I met a lot of people. I knew a lot of people. Uh, we connected like family. And I always remember that place. And it will always be part of my family. Uh, from there, I ended up moving home. I worked down at a radio station. In fact, today I had an um, interview with Vinny on a radio station. And that was uh, somewhat easier because I actually had him to talk to, back and forth, converse. Uh, this is a little different because now I have to tell you my story. And honestly, I'm not, um, I don't, I try to get out of my comfort zone to, to share things. And I'm okay with doing that. <clears throat> but it's gonna take me a little bit to just get more, more going. Um, Oh, all right. <laughs> so 
when uh moving back home um i actually worked at our college and i worked for i worked as the youth development cultural coordinator and working with the youth you know that was a big thing of who i am i really enjoyed doing that i can reach the youth really well when i very when i first home um, years ago, I worked in the Hayward High School, and I worked as the GOM tutor. And having youth come in my room, it was uh, it was good. I mean, I, I I know a lot of youth, a lot of youth, a lot of people I'm related to because I have a big family. I come from a big family. Um, when I would talk to the youth, I'd ask them, "Well, who's your family?" You know, and they would tell me. They would, "Well, my mom's this." this person. He said, oh, okay. And I wouldn't know him. And pretty soon I end up having to ask, well, who's your grandma? Who's your grandpa? And sure enough, I'd know him, you know, that, so it kind of eased the tension with me and the kids and I was able to relate. And then also I was able to relate once I knew who they were, what family they were, were from, I could let them know if we were related. <laughs> and a big bunch of kids, they always, they always really appreciated that, you know, having mm -hmm. that family, having that connection. Um, and there was this, I wanted to share this story about this one young man that he come into, he come from middle school and he was having a hard time. But when he come over to high school, he was still having a hard time. And he come and we visit and he sat there and I asked him, well, where are you from? And he looks at me and he tells me, Minneapolis. And I look at him and I said, Minneapolis. I said, no, where are you from? Because I come from Minneapolis. I said, well, who's your who's your family? And he looked at me and he told me a name. And it ended with McKnight. And it's like, I never heard that name before. And then I end up asking more and like, well, her dad was and told me that. I said, oh, that's your her son. I said, I went to school with her. So then I kind of was able to connect better with him and him having a hard time. It was, um, he got in trouble and that's part reason why he was in with me. But when we start talking, he start understanding a little bit more about our culture. And I think I helped him. I'm hoping I helped him. I'm pretty sure I did. When we talked, I corrected him. I said, so you told me when we first met, you were from Minneapolis. And I end up telling, I said, no, you're from LCO. You gotta remember that. That's where you come from. Um, part of the thing that he was so hard, had a hard time with was uh, he would get teased. Uh, and for native people, being teased is a good thing. I mean, it helps us connect. It makes us feel welcomed. It's um, that laughter is healing. So I'm trying to lead up into some some of these stories. I know by being able to talk to our youth, it's a good thing because our our youth need us. But our youth are also those that are going to be left here for us. They're going to continue anything and everything that we do. They're going to take it further than wherever we, we brought things. Um, right now, my grandkids are in Wadukanating. It's a language immersion school back in Lakota My son actually teaches there. Uh, my daughter lives out in Washington State. She's working on her degree. Um, so me, my son graduated, you know, from down in Minneapolis. And right now he's working with the youth, teaching the language. Grandkids are there. Um, that language connects us. You know, it, our language is um, something to be proud of. And I'm glad that everyone is, there's a lot of people that are learning more of our language. And some people, even tonight, there's another storytelling going on where um, language is gonna be spoken. I wish I had more of the language that I could spoke, speak it. I can understand, and I'm grateful that I'm able to understand some things. Um, 
One of the stories that I want to share with you is, let's see, where's my book? Grandfather in the Fog. So I remember how important the, the youth are for me. When I first heard the story, it made me think and I concentrated more on the youth. And I'm glad I did because I ha I'm able to talk with them. I'm able to uh, correct them, to discipline them in a loving way. Uh, I have so much respect for them. So the story was told to me a long time ago. Um, there was this grandfather in this village and he wanted to go hunting and his son was there with him. And his son said his boys wanted to go. And grandfather was kind of, you know, they were still young yet. They weren't ready. And he said, well, maybe they are now. So he decided, all right, I'll bring, we can bring them. So they go on a path and they go walking way out in the woods. And the kids are starting to get anxious. You know, are we there yet? Can we stop? Can we eat? I need to go bathroom. Can we stop? So they kept asking, you know, for a long time to keep stopping. And the grandfather was getting kind of upset because the grand, the son would not correct the, the kids. He would not say, okay, we'll be there shortly. You know, he would not inform them. He would not, all right, you guys just be patient. Um, so they kept going, they kept walking. And finally they got to the spot where they needed to be and they made camp. And it was too late to go out hunting that, that evening. So once they made camp, grandfather let let them know that tomorrow we're going to go out and the boys were end up um wanting to go but by the time they woke up in the morning they decided that they didn't want to go and so they had to leave the kids at that the camp while the son and grandfather went um while they went the boys left they were told by grandpa you guys watch the fire, make sure the fire don't go out. If the fire starts going out, go grab some more wood. Keep an eye on everything. We'll be back before it gets too late. So they left and it was a long time before they come back and the, the two boys were so anxious and so they, they weren't scared. That was a good thing, but they were um, wanting to not be there. They were getting bored and pretty soon, they end up seeing this group of frog, uh, not this group of frogs. Um, so they end up seeing this group of frogs. Frogs, sorry, I have another story about fog. Um, so the frogs, they walked over by them, and they were watching them for a while, and they were jump. The frogs were jumping all over, and the boys were um, getting bored just watching them. And remember that fire they had? So they thought it would be kind of cool to grab those frogs. And what they did, they were playing with them. But pretty soon they start throwing those frogs in that, those frogs in that fire. Excuse me. Um, when they did that, they didn't realize, they thought it was still fun. They kept doing it. And there's many frogs there. And pretty soon it was getting later and the grandpa and the dad end up coming back. And the one that noticed seeing see that was the grandfather. And he just looked and he stopped in his tracks and it kind of hurt him. So he kind of stood back and he didn't say anything. And he looked at his grandson or his son to think that his son was gonna say something. His son didn't say anything. His son kind of covered up for them. Well, they were having fun. They didn't have anything to do. Um, grandfather was disappointed. And it kind of really hurt him. And he decided, well, we're going to head back. And right away in the morning, we'll, we'll make our way back. So once nightfall came, you know, they all slept well. The kids stayed by their dad. They knew. Grandfather, he was upset, but he wasn't, he was more hurt than anything. And 
that next morning when they woke up, they got ready, packed everything up, and grandfather start walking. And the thing is, they start walking, and there was this big fog that was ahead of them. And the boys were all anxious. Well, let's get home. Let's just get home. And the dad says, well, we can go through it. And the grandfather says, no, it wasn't here before. We shouldn't go through it. And the dad was getting tired of hearing the boys complain about get, being so tired and wanting to get home. And so the dad tells the grandfather, I'm, I'm going to take them through there. We'll meet you there over at our camp. And the grandfather, you know, just let him do it. He didn't say anything that since well, I'm going around. And so they, they went their separate ways. The son and the kids went further while grandfather took a walk. He walked way around. Later that evening, the grandfather got back to camp. Um, he looked around for his son and his grandsons. He couldn't find them. And he was kind of disappointed and kind of, you know, felt bad. And so what he did was he packed up some more stuff and he went back to the same direction where he, they took off that first, you know, to get there. And as he was walking towards, you know, he made it all the way back to the camp where they stayed. That fog was gone. And he ended up walking back to the camp. The son and the boys weren't there. So I end up telling a story to the kids. And I every time I tell a story to the kids, I ask them what they get from it. And for me, I can't ask you guys what you get mm -hmm. from it. So some of their responses were, which I'm really glad, you know, they said those boys should have listened, you know, which is which is true. But then they also said that father should have corrected. And that's another truth. Um, us, our stories help us. You know, they help us educate, they help educate ourselves and they help educate others. Um, the grandfather was sad, but he had to accept what had happened. And one thing that we end up learning, you know, from this story is to take care of our kids, take care of them in a good way so that they are able to follow a path that is good for themselves and they're able to learn in a good way. Um, sometimes being able to discipline our kids is scary, but our kids respect us, we respect them, and it's okay to discipline, to correct their behaviors, because eventually they'll grow up into young people, and those young people will have kids of their own. Um, so that was the one story. Hey again. Hello, friends. This is Liz again. Sorella asked a really good question about what you're getting out of this. And I think that's a super question. And I'm hopeful some of you are taking notes and maybe at the end during the chat session, you could leave a message for her because um, she will get all of those. And you can tell her what you thought of a particular story or what you thought she was going with, where she thought she was going with that story. We talked about that earlier, Sorella and I, and she likes, and crowd engagement. So please engage. We Very much. Thank you. I know I'm standing up here all by myself, right? <laughs> but I know you guys are out there. I don't want to know who's all out there. Um, so like in my introduction on the paper that says I do beadwork, you know, I wanted to show you something that I've done. I brought a few items. I'll just see if you want to sit down. I would love to sit but I know it's hard on the phone. And I don't know if you guys can see this. This is some of the beadwork that I've done. And I actually taught how to make these. My mother, um, Evelyn Eichem, she passed a few years ago. And or actually it's been a while. Um, I'm very grateful for her because she taught me a lot. She taught me how to cook, how to sew, um, how to laugh, how to tease. You know, I grew up in, I'm the youngest of my, my family. I think I was babied by our older, my older siblings. Um, I think, can I? 
You can either come right here. Or I'll go up. over there. Um, Please. I'm going to switch, guys. Please pause for just one minute. We're going to switch so that uh, Sorella can use my laptop. Let me get rid of the background so that you can see your stuff. Okay, take it away, Sorella. I'm going to go turn that off. All right. So can you see my skirt? I mean, my mother helped me. My mother helped show. You know, she taught me a lot. I'm very grateful for her. I'm the baby of my family, like I said. Um, my older siblings have taught me how to do things too. You know, and I'm very grateful for them. I've always been quiet and that's okay. I don't mind that. But this is another part that I'm, this is actually my son's, I didn't finish it. So I don't know if you can see it good. This I was gonna make into a camp for his graduation. Um, here's a pair of moccasins that I'm not done with, but they're started. People are responding through hearts. So you're getting a lot of hearts on your feet. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I told you they were going to love your beadwork. Well, everybody does, right? Mm -hmm. Let me pin this for you. Okay, cool. All right. Here's a pair of earrings that I've done. Um, I was able, working at the college, I was able to, I worked in our extension department and I was able to teach classes. Like I said, I'm very grateful for my mom. She taught me a lot, a Christmas bulb. Um, Start of a lanyard. I was telling Liz that my mom was the youngest of um, 14 kids. She was the baby. And then my mom and dad had me. And I'm the baby of them. So my age are my, the people that were, would be like my brothers and sisters are much older than me for my aunts and uncles. Um, I'm grateful because I think I have that an older mentality and I'm okay with that. Uh, but I, I'm also okay because I'm able to, maybe I matured early. I don't know. Maybe I just, I don't know. But it was, um, it was a fun time for me. So that story with the grandfather, you know, being able to um, <laughs> she can see the behind the scenes. I keep rolling around. I'm Poor Sorella. Oh my gosh. Just hang on. Wow. Well, I'm not a professional. I'm doing my <laughs> best, Sorella. Me too. Me We're too. just glad you're here and you're sharing your good stories. I know when I'm warm. And it is it is warm in here. There. Okay, we're good. So that story with the fog, you know, that was one that I really am grateful for because it started helping me see how much respect was needed for the kids, for the youth. I'm able to... I'm grateful that I'm able to correct them. They have respect for me and I'm really glad that they do. I think they know that I love them. Um, working with the, the ones that I started out with are, you know, over 18 now and they're having their own families and a lot still connect with me. Um, as I'm thinking, there's others, oh, my notebook. Oh, thanks. Like I told you that story about, um, 
I don't know if I continued. Did I tell that story about him being short and teasing? That's it. Okay. All right. Um, I'm kind of jumping all over. I didn't have my notebook. I'm just going, going the best I can, I guess. Uh, teaching at the college, I actually was able to take classes. I took one from Dennis White, uh, Bay uh, Weaving and belt weaving and he's actually was um brought out to the smithsonian for his weaving his belt weaving and his bags i wish i would have brought mine with but i didn't but i know with him he ended up you know one of the biggest things that i take from him is that and even though you know i do this when i teach and i'm grateful you know like i said i, I am i am really grateful dennis ended up saying that he learned from a woman and in fact was one of our relatives a long time ago she would sit and there's a picture of her weaving and it would be um, sticks and the yarn just on it in grass uh, that's how they did it a long time ago they would just sit on grass and do that um, he ended up learning how to do it but he also learned from a book and he's well known for it uh, the thing that he shared with me were these words of you know, you want to share what you know so that it's carried on. You don't want to keep it. Uh, being able to share something that you know, you know, it's going to be passed on. Just like my mom. She taught me how to sew. She taught me how to cook. Uh, yeah, I can make fried bread. I think some of you know that. <laughs> Uh, actually, I'm trying to sell it too. <laughs> Not now. Oh, oh, oh yeah, place. she. I brought her one up. I just bought some. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, so being able to share, you know, that's a big part of who we are. A big part of Anishinaabe people, you know, we help. Uh, there was a time where I had to learn, unlearn certain behaviors because I grew up in. Uh, alcoholic home you know our family was my mom actually didn't drink but I was still raised I caught on behaviors with, from her because it's a learned behavior on some things like, like control worry that's what I had I had anger too so I had to unlearn all this stuff and that's it, and it that's the dough <laughs> can I show you <laughs> yep yep so Sorella is a famous fry bread maker every native person has their own recipe Hers is one of the best, right? <laughs> so better than mine. So I says, yeah, I want some before my daughter goes back to college. And she brings this giant bowl up for me and Vidi, who's a little tiny person. But And that's not even the largest bowl. I did a small <laughs> batch. That's a small that's batch. small batch? Yes. I got another show and tell. I need to oh, okay. So you can tell she's a beater because she's got this fabulous bag full of all her beating supplies that she takes with her um just a really awesome person thanks oh, so much for thank you doing this. yes yeah you gotta feed I can't so, yeah, so who wants fry bread my house <laughs> come over <laughs> and have ready um i know there's so many stories that i wanted to share well i don't i can't even remember what i was talking about anyone else <laughs> it's like uh, so I oh, I'm sorry. She's. I got a note from a colleague that said a couple of people have asked what happened to the boys in the story. Oh, they were never found. They remember grandfather ended up walking all the way through, and he come back to the camp. They were gone. So was the dad. In that in that story, you know, it asking those kids, you know, in the class in my room, you know, what was the meaning from that story? Um, being able to watch your kids, watch over them being able to discipline your kids, you know, that's a big thing. They were gone. We lost them. There's no, um, so that can bring me back to when I worked at WOJB too. I was uh, office manager at one time and a friend had come and he come sit down and we were visiting and he was telling, I mean, we just got, he says, you know, Sorrell, I had a dream. And I said, oh, and he ended up telling me this dream and I was okay with that because I can, for my dreams, I know for, as Anishinaabe people or maybe other indigenous too, that um, our dreams have a lot of meaning for us. Mm -hmm. um, there's one dream I had that had four different meanings for me in my lifetime. And I'm grateful that 
you know, I, I know I've been watched over. I know I've been guided. I know I'm able to say things that need to be said. Um, when he was telling me the story, you know, he sits down and it's just, it's just a, just a conversation we were just having. He was, you know, so I had this stream and the stream was about this it kind of, I wasn't sure what was going on, but this tree, this tree was growing up, this big pine tree, it was growing up into the sky. And the thing is that, that those branches were grabbing, they were grabbing our kids. And I just sat there and I, you know, I was listening to him and he was telling me this. And I just looked at him and I said, well, you know, if we don't start taking care of our kids, they're going to be taken away from us. And he just looked at me surprised and I'm sitting there and he says, you know, Jerry told me the same thing, but he didn't tell me so directly. Um, so with me, I do have that. My sister says it's more direct. Um, I'd rather say lovingly direct, you know, <laughs> than as, but yeah, I could <laughs> say we're blunt. It's part of our culture. Yeah, just speak it just, truth. it is, it is, you know, being truthful is a, is a good thing. Um, I am grateful that he told me that story. And he also told me that that was the same thing that uh, he's, he's another relative that he ended up, you know, telling him that, yeah, this is what's going to happen if we don't start taking care of our kids. They're going to be taken away from us. Um, and I know that is, you know, scary because our kids are going to be here long after we're gone. We need to be able to help them, guide them, so that they are able to take care of themselves and their their kids yet to come. Um, so I'm going to tell another story. I'm going to tell one about, well, this is kind of like a more recent one. All right. So there was this older man and a young man. And this younger man and him were walking in New York City, or maybe even Vegas, I don't know. But it was really loud. Everything, you know, lights, the cars, horns, buses, people, everything. That when they were walking, the old man tells them, you know, most people hear what they're, what's important to them. And... As they were walking, he goes, did you, he tells that young one, he goes, did you hear that? And that young boy goes, what? He goes, there's a cricket over there. And amongst all this noise, that old man heard that cricket, cricket. And that boy, that young man was surprised. So they, come on, I'll show you. So they walk over to where that grass is at, that, that tree. And they look in there and here's that cricket. And that young man was so surprised that that he heard that cricket. And he goes, how did you hear that? And he says, you, you hear what's most important to you. He goes, here, I'll show you. And that old man, what he did was he took his change out of his pocket and he threw it down. And you hear those all over on a sidewalk. And pretty soon people stopped and they looked. And they looked for that money. And that young man just looked at the old man and said, wow. And he, he was surprised that, he was surprised at that. And then pretty soon as I kept walking, you know, there was another animal, I don't know what it was, but he ended up hearing it, the young man. So it made him more awake, more aware, you know, what's in your heart, what you hear, you know, it's there, we gotta listen. Um, I'm looking at my notes. <clears throat> oh, all right. I know there's probably eight thirty. Yeah, plenty of time. Yeah. Okay, okay, plenty of time. She says. All right. So this one story. It's about a muskrat. Long ago, this muskrat. He was uh, living in his little. I don't know. He was living. He was just living it up. <laughs> and he ended up. He had this tail. Long time ago, he used to have a tail or he still has a tail, but a tail that was really furry and a whole bunch of fur. And he had his tail and he'd always brush it out. He'd wash it and he was so proud of his tail. 
And one day the rabbit come and the rabbit was jealous and he didn't, he was jealous of that tail. He wanted that tail. You know, that bunny has that little brown tail and that muskrat kept brushing it out, you know, and he wasn't trying to um, show it off. He was just so proud of it, you know, and the mus uh, the rabbit was jealous. And so that rabbit thought, well, I want the better tail. And what he did was he went home and he made this event. He planned this event for a party and he goes to these mice and he says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go and write the muskrat and have him come. And you're going to, at nighttime, you're going to chew all that fur off his tail and you're going to wrap it in sweet grass. You know? And I'm going to go and invite him to this party in honor of him. So that next day, you know, the, the mice end up going, staying there. And one of the, the rabbit goes and invites him. He says, but I, he tells the muskrat, I'm going to have two mice come over here and help you get ready for tomorrow's event. And the muskrat was so happy and excited. So he, the rabbit ended up leaving and the two mice come back and he comes spent the night with him while the muskrat was sleeping. That's what those mice did. They chewed all that hair off that tail and all it was just that skinny old thing. And they wrapped it in sweet grass. And come the, the party, the event, the big event, the next day, um, the rabbit comes and gets everybody. And says, all right, now we gotta go. So the, the mice helped him carry his tail. And there they are sitting in the event and um, the muskrat's dancing around. He still has that sweet grass on his tail, but he's still dancing around. He's all excited because this is, you know, he gets to show off his tail. And the rabbit sits back and, Eventually, as that muskrat is dancing, his uh, sweet grass starts falling off. And pretty soon, it's just the tail that's there. not No fur, just the tail. And the muskrat was so sad. He was so hurt by, he didn't know what had happened. And um, the mice kind of backed off and the rabbit ended up running away. And it was just, it wasn't a, it wasn't a good thing. And see, like right now, I would ask you, what do you get from that story? And I can ask Liz. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Why did you, they got serious about chewing the tail off, but then they didn't even use it? Like, what the heck? What was up with that rabbit? The rabbit was jealous. That's so it. Jealousy that's is it. no good. Jealousy so is no good. But also the, the muskrat, you know, he ended up, I think, I think he also learned to be humble after that, mm. you know, that humility so that we need to be reminded, you know, the stories that we're told, you know, we tell stories that in wintertime when there's snow on the ground and the stories always have a teaching and even, um, you know, your life stories too. Like that one I, sh I shared with the kid from Minneapolis, you know, life stories, teachings, you know, something to help educate so that it makes it easier for us. Um, you know what I like about our stories is that I can see myself in them. Like sometimes I've been the rabbit, sometimes mm -hmm. I've been the muskrat, you know what I mean? And I think we've all been that way, you know? I think that's a good lesson for everybody mm -hmm. that it isn't about, you know, being scolded, but just to be mindful of yeah. how we are. I always try to do things in a good way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, with me, I pray, I smudge. Uh, I went through a hardship and um, when I went through a hardship, I had to heal. I ended up losing, you know, two of my brother. We lost, you know, our family. We lost two of our older brothers. I lost one of my friends. I put, had to put my dog down. Um, Long time ago, I had this dream when I was in my youth, and it was a, uh, I was standing there, and there was a fog around me, opening, and I seen a person coming at me, walking towards out of this fog, and the thing is, they come out, and I recognized him, and he smiled, and my dream was gone, and I never thought about that dream again. But like I was saying, I had all this hardship that came into my life, and me being busy, I was just you know, going day by day, doing what I needed to. I went to work. I did classes. I went to work. I did classes. Um, 
I did this and I was okay with doing that because that's what I, what I knew. And I'm grateful that I can share what I know. Um, but I didn't realize that I was, I know how to heal from when I have a death. You know, I know what needs to be done for myself. I know how to let go. I know that they're going to be in the spirit world. I'm, go I'm happy for them. But for me, going through this whole process of all these, you know, people in my life and having to make that choice to put my dog down, it was hard. And I didn't recognize that I was, I needed that healing. I needed something. So from this dream, this person ended up, you know, he ended up being in my life later. And I'm grateful for him because once he come into my life, I mean, because we didn't talk you know, in high school, we didn't, but then we lost that same friend and somehow we end up connected and we just start visiting and he comes spend time with me. And the thing with him, I'm so grateful for him because he brought that laughter. That's what I needed was that laughter. And today I am grateful because I'm back to laughing, and I'm back to teasing, I'm back to joking. And that's what helps heal. When um, I lost my, when we lost our dad <clears throat> years ago, um, we had to know if he was going to go traditional or Made, you know, be buried. It's different, a little different, but no yeah. one. What's Made? So Made is more of our medicine lodge, you know, our ceremonies. Our, a traditional is just, uh, it's not as strong, as powerful as the Made way. Um, so there's that difference. But it's I still made it, not it's, Christian. Right, no, no, no Christian. So I, we needed to know which way to bury my dad. And when I, we talked to my uncle, my uncle said that they went through the lodge when they were little. So my dad had to be buried through the day lodge. And the first night, um, we ended up having a ceremony at my house. And I was the one that said, in a, said a prayer. You know, we had a little feast and we, I said a prayer and it was good. It was um, when my dad passed, I carried a lot of guilt because he was in a nursing home and I didn't go out there as often as I could have. And that guilt and that sadness, you know, had a part of me. So when we figured out how to go, how my dad could go after that first night, when I did that ceremony, we got, you know, it done properly the next night, the second night. So, um, medicine man come and did this for us. That next day, you know, I talked of our dreams. I tried to put our dreams in here, how important our dreams are. And that next day, my brother calls me and he let me know that he dreamt of our dad. And it was a really good dream. Um, my dad didn't come to me, but he come to my brother. But that dream was meant for me because I carried that guilt. I carried that sadness. Uh, I understand. I believe in our ceremonies. You know, I believe, I know they're strong. I can feel them when... My brother explained that dream that he had. He goes, yeah, Sorella, we were down at the old house. And down at the old house, there was a big front window. And down that window, you could look down that hill and there was, uh, we lived by a lake. So past that window, a big old flash come. And then he walked around to the door and the door was over this way. And my dad swung that door open <clears throat> and I was standing behind my brother and I ended up peeking behind him, you know, looking. And my brother says, oh, dad, come on in. And my dad looked and he just looked at me like that and he smiled and he said, oh no, son. I said, I, I just come check on him. I got places to go. And he smiled and he took his flashlight and he went off. And I knew that dream was meant for me because I knew he was doing what he needed to at the time he was supposed to. Uh, so our ceremonies, you know, something happens and we're buried and something else happens. So he was doing exactly what our ceremonies tell us are, that they're gonna be doing. So once my brother told me that dream, I was able to let go of that guilt and that hardship that I had. And I was so happy because I knew that at the end of these ceremonies that my dad was going to be with the rest of our, our family, our relatives up in the spirit world. It was a little different when my, my mom passed away because she was Catholic. And I had to, um, we all respected her wishes. You know, when I was younger, I told my mom that I wanted to do our ceremony instead of uh, Catholic. And she respected that. She had respect for me so that I, I knew to choose what was more comfortable for me. And our ceremonies, our traditional way feels more healing, more forgiving than how I was raised when I was uh, in uh, grade school. Um, 
but my mom respected that. And when she was buried, we buried her Catholic. But I also know that even though, you know, it's a different ceremony type thing, that she is going to be with their relatives once, you know, the four days were, were up for her. Um, I know that everything that we go through in life helps us. It teaches us. Um, we're able to heal. We're able to share things. Um, I'm okay with sharing sharing my stuff. Um, oh, I have another story. Seven forty eight. Oh, seven forty eight. Um, so this is part uh, part of mine. Well, yeah. So I was told this long time ago about this. Um, it always seems like, so it, it's another older man, grandpa, but he had a grandson. And this was way before, way long time ago. And he was saying that, you know, if you're ever out in the woods or ever lost, or if you need to know where something is or someone is, just listen to the animals or the birds. And so his grandson did get lost one time and he listened and he heard these crows. And these crows are making this noise. And he followed those crows. And when he followed those crows, he seen people. So he was there. You know, he was he was able to make it to where he needed to be. Um, so that story was shared to the next generation. Whereas this generation ended up having the grandson go over to Vietnam. And while that young man was over in Vietnam, you know, he's he told the grandfather told the son, listen for those crows, listen. You know, listen for those animals, those crows especially. When the grandson was over there, he was surrounded and he didn't know he was scared. You know, his enemy was close by, but he didn't know exactly where they are at. And for some reason, he heard crows. And those crows end up, acknowledge, he acknowledged the crows. And so instead of going that way, he went the other way and he was able to get out of there. Um, I'm grateful I heard that story because personally, I had a scare with my kitty. My kitty's a house cat, and I was, I never let her outside, and I got really close to her. And one night, I end up going to bed, and normally she comes sleep with, sleeps with me. I thought, oh, man, she didn't come sleep with me. So that next morning, I end up going into, you know, different closets that I thought I may have been in. I went to downstairs. I opened the door. She wasn't in there. I couldn't find her. And I actually start crying because I was scared. And... I end up going outside to pray to go put some tobacco out. I mean, I normally go put tobacco out anyways, but I end up praying. And this time I remembered that story. And I asked, you know, you know, help me. Help me find I'll take better care of her. Help me. And when I put that tobacco out, I heard those crows behind my house. And I just thought, all right, I'm going to go. I'm going to go back there. I end up going back there. And... And the crows were up there and I seen them and I got closer and I looked down and there was my kitty. She was under some branches. So I ended up, I walked up close to her and I was able to get her and I actually cried and I was very thankful, you know, that was, so I know our stories are true. I know, you know, things in our, our past, our dreams, you know, they come true. They're, they're there to show you something. Um, I th I believe our dreams are powerful, you know, and even as, you know, maybe there's some stuff for non-Native people with dreams, but I know for us, our dreams are help guide us. Mm -hmm. Teaching on that. Can I share what I was taught yes. about that, about dreams? This is Liz, and we were talking earlier, but one of the things, um, sometimes, you know, of course, my parents have passed, and sometimes they come to me in dreams, but other times I hear from other people, mm -hmm. like you talked about. And I asked somebody about that. I'm like, why, why is that? Like, I miss them so much. Why would they go to somebody I barely know and give them this message for me? And it was, I was told, well, maybe that message was important and they wanted to make sure you had someone who could give you a hug if you needed a hug. You know what I mean? And that they come to you all the time, even if you don't remember mm -hmm. in your dreams. They're with you all the time in, in the best way, you know, mm -hmm. trying to offer guidance and help you and support you <clears throat> but if they have something maybe they feel like they need another person on earth here because they can't physically put their arms around you anymore mm -hmm. but they tell somebody so there's somebody there for you 
that's a good way of looking at things. And um, I also know that uh, I've seen my mom in my dreams. I've seen my brother. Uh, I know that they're good and I'm happy for them. And I know that I shouldn't be sad. I shouldn't miss them. I do miss them, but I don't have that sadness because that happiness of knowing where they're at takes me further than a sadness would. Um, when my brother had my the dream of my dad, I was grateful that he shared it with me. I was grateful that he was able to get the dream. I still have not seen my dad in a dream, but I know he's watching me because I seen him in the clouds. I seen his face in the clouds. He was watching, he was looking down at me. And I seen that more than a couple times. So I don't know, maybe you think I'm silly or being, but no, that's my, I've seen it. And I'm grateful that I've, I've done that. I'm grateful and I share with other people because if you actually pay attention and look, I mean, our lives are so busy. Just think of that coin, you know, those coins being tossed, that cricket. You slow down and listen, you'll be able to see stuff and hear stuff and feel. No, that's all real stuff. Yeah. Are you ready to take some questions or did you have a okay, more you want sure. to do? No, I'm, I think I went through stuff. That are you, uh, people are loving it. Yeah. We're really enjoying it. <laughs> Got a lot and of I'm positive. just louder. I'm still sweating. I know, but... right? But you're doing amazing. Yeah. Um, we got a few questions. Uh, one person, you were just talking about smudging. Said you prayed and smudged and put down tobacco. What, what does that mean? And so I do have another story with smudging. Um, when I put down tobacco, when anyone puts tobacco down normally by a tree or out in the water, it's our way of offering our prayer. And some people smoke their pipe and that smoke grows up. It's it's our way of praying. Um, smudging. I, oh, it's right here. I actually brought some in and I lit some up. This is sage, and you can smudge your sage and cedar, but that helps cleanse the air. It helps cleanse the air around you. It helps cleanse what you're feeling. You know, it takes that negative thought out. And I can, I'm going to share this because I know that um, I, I do believe in, I do believe in our ceremonies. I believe in our smudge. I believe in our tobacco. I believe in praying. Everyone has a different way of praying and having a different way to connect to the creator. You know, we we believe that everything is a, a living, you know, our trees, it helps us so much. Um, this one time I was at a funeral and people were having such a hard time in that building. And one of the uncle come, comes out and he's standing by me. And we're talking and he, he he sees that too, you know, they're having a hard time. And I went in my car and I said, here, go like this. And I end up giving him that sage and that a shell so that he could go in that building and do that. And when he did that, the people that were standing around end up coming out of the building. So that that kind of helped them where they were able to let go. You know, that healing, it was a it was a better, it gives a better healing, better, better feeling for you. So they were able to uh, finish a ceremony and that was good. Otherwise that, that feeling of trying to stay there was, was there. And it's better that they were able to leave when they did. Smudging does help. Another question. Um, they love your stories, but do you find it, youth might have to be convinced to listen or do you find the youth today are, are open to listening? Youth Especially listen. those teaching stories. <laughs> youth listen to me. I'm very grateful that they do. Um, I think I think that being able to have that connection with the youth, you know, I make mistakes and I let them see that. You know, I'm not, I laugh at myself. People laugh at me, you know, I'm I'm okay. Um Having that connection with the youth is is good because then that builds into more. And 
once they start listening, then more of their friends are going to listen and they're going to want to do things. I know that, um, you know, just being yourself, having that, a positive, that ripple effect that helps you, it helps other people around you too as well. And I think if you take time and if you are worried about them not listening to you, then find a way of praying so that that prayer can cover them too. And it will be more open for them to come and listen. We've got time for one more. Someone had a question. What's the significance of sweetgrass? We talked about it in the muskrat story and then as one of the medicines. So that's another thing that we can use to smudge. Um, it smells really good, but it has a, if you ever lift it, are actually you can whoever asked that question light it and see how your thought changes if mm -hmm. it changes they help us heal they help us feel better they take away negative things um cedar is another one i don't know if i mentioned it but cedar you can drink as tea um you know mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. if you ever had a cough um one thing that would help you with the cough, I see and cedar resin, but I can't remember. But cedar helps you with a cold if you drink it, cedar tea. But if you ever have a cough, if you cut up onions and put sugar in it, you drink that that juice that helps you with the cough. But that goes along with your cedar tea. Yes. I have a question about your, a beadwork question. Oh, okay. You talk about you being a good bead worker. I'm going to do my show and tell again. <laughs> so that's her beadwork. What makes good beadwork versus eh, regular beadwork or beginner beadwork? So, and you know, because it's not necessarily a question of good, I guess. How would you define or describe that? So there's a lot of beadwork artists out there that are able to um, bead and they bead. There's one needle approach, there's two needle approaches, um, there's applique beadwork, there's rat beadwork, there's peyote beadwork. What makes a good beadwork artist is if you're able to get your beads to lay flat. Mm. You know, that's, that's a good thing. And sometimes um, there might be an open spot where you want to put a bead, just leave it. Wait till you finish your product and go back and look at it. But once you put a bead in there, that gets bumpy. I think um, having patience is a big thing. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time. No! no. <laughs> um, <laughs> Cyrilla sent me these amazing pictures, and I used it because I think that's fabulous. Who's this? That's my granddaughter, Mariah. We okay. are out in Washington State. Oh. We are watching. That's a fun day. Yeah, and she was laughing at my son because he was getting me with those pictures. <laughs> it happens when you got long hair like ours. Uh, well, I can't thank you enough, Sorella. Mm -hmm. um, we weren't able to get to all the questions. If you do have a question, that's your email, right? So people yes. can contact you if, if they have a question or if they want to buy Freiburg, right? But it has to be in the, eh, the northern Wisconsin area. Just <laughs> right, the right, right. Yeah. Dope. The northern Wisconsin area. Oh, and if you come to the Powell, you can have fiber there. Yeah. Um, LCO Powell. Yep. Honor the year. Oh, and my sister Becky, if you guys have questions about Powell stuff, we do, um, which she's going to try and ask Becky to come join. Yeah. But we also mm -hmm. do landings during the summertime where you come and see, learn, you know, up there. Mm -hmm. so okay. We'll learn. try to get that posted on our social media. Thank you. Yes. Um, Because that would be great for people to be able to do that. So that's a little bit. It will, this whole recording will be available on our YouTube channel. Give us a few days. It takes a couple of days for us to um, uh, put everything up. And if you go to the next slide, there we go. And then you can follow us on all our various things, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube. Uh, also, do you take other speaking engagements if people want to? <laughs> now she <tricked> does. <laughs> now, <She tricked me. laughs> now she's got the taste for it. So um, I love people who are always like, oh, I don't tell stories. Oh, I don't talk. And then they get going and people just love it. I think I think they make some of the best storytellers. You know, I think they do because 
you know, I always have this thing about our quieter kin. They have so much to share, but people don't give them that chance. And that's what I love about this series is that we, we give people that chance um, to share those amazing stories. So Kristen, could you go back to that slide just in case anybody does need uh, Sorella's email there, there, sir from LCO yeah. at hotmail.com. Yeah. Hotmail. <laughs> yeah. Do they still, I guess they I still use hotmail. So yeah, if you need uh dough, beadwork, speaking, or just a pal, you'll be, <laughs> there, you go. there we go. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming now next week. And Kristen, could you go to our last slide or maybe I don't have it. I think I do. Oh, shoot. I apologize. Next week, we have uh, Tina Van Zyl, who will be joining us from Mole Lake. Uh, she's an absolute brilliant in environmentalism, and she has a lot of amazing stories to share. So meet us right back here, either at our watch parties or on the online world. And we will be same time, same place. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. <laughs>